Welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Minou Shafiq and I'm the director of the London School of Economics and Political Science and I'm going to chair this event today that's hosted by LSE's Grantham Research Institute on Climate Change and the Environment. We're very pleased to be launching uh, a new report called Net Zero Central Banking, a new phase in greening the financial system, and to welcome an, ex an excellent panel of speakers to the LSE who will be discussing the content of that report. We'll hear first from Nick Robbins, who's Professor in Sustainable Finance uh, at the LSE's Grantham Research Institute. Nick leads the sustainable finance research theme and the focus on, of his work is how to mobilize finance for a just transition, the role of central banks and regulators, and how the financial system can support the restoration of nature. Nick is one of the authors of the report and he'll provide us with a short presentation and overview of its findings. We'll then turn to our panel. First, we'll hear from Luis Pereira da Silva, who is the Deputy General Manager of the Bank for International Settlements. Before being at the BIS, Luis was Deputy Governor of the Central Bank of Brazil, where we worked together uh, for several years, and he was there since 2020. Prior to that, he had various positions at the World Bank, and he also served as Chief Economist for the Brazilian Ministry of Budget and Planning, and as De Brazil's Deputy Finance Minister for International Affairs. We'll then turn to Sarah Breeden, who's the Executive Director for UK Deposit Takers Supervision at the Bank of England. Sarah is responsible for the supervision of the UK's banks, building societies and credit unions, someone else who I had the pleasure of working with before, and she has oversight of the bank's work enhancing the financial system's resilience to climate change and is leading the macro financial work stream for the network of central banks and supervisors for greening the financial system. And then finally, we'll hear from Ulrich Voltz, who is one of the authors of the report and who's a reader of economics at SOAS at the University of London and director of SOAS's Center for Sustainable Finance. He's also a senior research fellow at the German Development Institute and honorary professor at Leipzig. Uli has worked extensively on central banking and climate change, including on questions of uh, sovereign debt and risk. The report that Nick and Ulrich are presenting today comes at a critical time, obviously in the run up to COP26 and the climate summer, summit, which will happen this November. And at a moment when many of the major central banks are thinking about how to embark on a new stage of greening the financial system and thinking through what their role should be in that. A good example of that is in the UK, where for the first time, the government included the net zero transition as a government priority in the remit letters for the Bank of England's financial and monetary policy committees. And that of course resulted in the bank responding that it would try to take action in its corporate bond purchase scheme to account for the impact of climate. So action is already being taken on many fronts and it provides an important example of how monetary authorities are beginning to think about net zero policies. Today, we'll discuss these issues as well as the implications for other central banks around the world, uh, drawing on the findings of the report. But first, let's hear from Nick uh, on the report. Just a small footnote for those who are Twitter users, the hashtag for today's event is hashtag LSE Biodiversity. This event is being recorded and will be made available as a podcast. So let me now turn to Nick. And just a reminder, if you have questions, we'll be using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Questions will be submitted uh, and I will ask them on your behalf. Please do tell us your name, affiliation and location since we've got participants from all over the world. And now I'm delighted to hand over to Nick. Well, thank you so much, uh, Manoush. Thank you so much for chairing this and thanks for the introduction and thanks to all of you who are joining us uh, today. I'm going to share a few slides, so please bear with me while I share my screen. 
Right. Um, so thank you so much, uh, Manoush, uh, again. And I'm really pleased to be able to um, give you some of the highlights from uh, this report, which I co-authored with my uh, colleague at uh, Grantham, uh, Simon Dickow, and also with uh, Ulrich Voltz, who you'll hear from in a few uh, minutes. What I'm going to do in the next, next uh, few moments is just set, you, set out the, the key findings uh, and our uh, recommendations. So uh, here we go. So our key finding from this uh, report is that as guardians of the financial system, uh, central banks and financial supervisors need to introduce explicit strategies uh, to support net zero. So how did we come to this conclusion? We know that there is a race to net zero finance going on. We started first with the science. Um, and the recommendation uh, from the International Panel on Climate Change that to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels, we need to uh, cut uh, greenhouse gas carbon dioxide emissions by about 45% from 2010 levels by the end of this decade, 2030, and then reach net zero around 2050. Clearly, this will require huge policy action to achieve. And we're seeing uh, a number of countries taking the lead. Uh, the UK was the first G20 country to set a net zero target uh, for 2050. Many others are following around 127 countries responsible about 60% of emissions have now adopted or are planning to adopt net zero targets. China has come through with a 2060 target. Um, President Biden is indicating that he will adopt that as well. And also indications only in the last few days uh, from India uh, as well. So policy signals clearly have to be translated into, into action, uh, but those, those, those policy signals are now uh, coming. We're going to need to mobilize huge amounts of finance to this, reallocate capital uh, from high carbon to net zero investments. So we have movement as well within the financial sector. We have asset owners, pension funds, insurance firms with about five trillion in assets setting net zero targets, banks with a further 15 trillion in assets also setting net zero targets for 2050, and then asset managers as well with around nine trillion in assets also committing to net zero by 2050. So the question we were trying to ask in this report is, we've seen movement uh, from market players. What is the role then for financial and monetary authorities? So clearly, central banks and supervisors over the last few years have increasingly incorporated climate change into their prudential and now into monetary policies. So why do we suggest that a more explicit stance on net zero is now required? And we uh, identified a dual rationale for taking action. First, the, the core financial stability uh, mandate for central banks and supervisors, and uh, that net zero is really the best way of minimizing risks of climate change to the stability of the system and the macroeconomy, that as we go beyond 1.5 degrees Celsius of, of warming, uh, the ability of authorities to um, keep the stability of the system will be impaired, and that could threaten the functioning of the financial system. So clearly, financial stability is is the core rationale. But then there's also this, this second uh, rationale, which is policy coherence and the importance to ensure that uh, their activities as central banks and supervisors are consistent with government net zero policy, that, which is increasing around the world, particularly in those countries where there is an explicit secondary mandate, for example, within the European Union, where the ECB uh, is required to support the economic policies of the, uh, of the uh, European Union, where that doesn't prejudice uh, its primary mandate of uh, price stability. So those are the two core reasons, and we believe that taking uh, a, a clear stance on net zero is important. It will provide clarity to the market, predictability to market actors, and also help to ensure integrity across the system as we see more and more uh, commitments made to net zero and a need to ensure that these commitments are robust. As uh, Manoush uh, pointed out earlier, we're starting to see signs of um, uh, alignment to net zero emerging from uh, central banks and supervisors. And a most recent example in the UK uh, was at the time of the budget, uh, the Chancellor Exchequer sent uh, remit letters both to the uh, monetary and uh, financial policy committees of the Bank of England, restating uh, its economic policy uh, and including that this now incorporated the transition to an environmentally sustainable and resilient zero economy. And the response 
uh, from the Bank of England that it will now be uh, exploring how it will provide more information on adjusting its corporate bond purchase scheme to account for climate impact of the issuers of the bonds it holds. And I'm sure Sarah will touch on that uh, in her remarks. This, I think, is one example. Uh, we're seeing other examples, and I, I ex we expect more, uh, more statements like this, maybe in other parts of policy uh, in the coming weeks and months. So those are, those are sort of, I suppose, the first signs of, of a net zero banking spring, central banking spring. What would this look like if this became a reality uh, in terms of uh, core practices uh, by, these, by these institutions? We believe it's important to take a comprehensive approach. We've identified seven recommendations, and I'm sure you can't read these uh, in, in very small type. So I'm just going to go through these seven recommendations in uh, one by one. So the first recommendation is one of strategy. Uh, important uh, for central banks and supervisors to be clear to the market uh, about their policy. Uh, and we recommend uh, that they need to develop a net zero roadmap with both sort of long-term expectations and also near-term actions. Clearly, close liaison and coordination with policymakers is going to be crucial. And, and I think a, an important role here for these central banks uh, to provide independent advice to government policymakers about how best to align the financial system with the net zero target. So strategy uh, is, the, is the starting point. The second then is, is prudential policy, both at the micro level, looking at particular institutions, but also at the macro uh, prudential level, looking at the stability of the system as a whole. And here we suggest it's important to align expectations of supervisors, uh, and particularly one recommendation to require all regulated financial institutions to submit net zero transition plans to ensure that uh, they, they are going to be increasingly aligned with the net zero target. To do this, we'll need to upgrade the uh, Task Force Climate Related Financial Disclosures um, recommendations uh, to uh, give particular guidance around net zero, and that's something that is already uh, underway. Third is the area of scenarios. Uh, we need to be forward looking about the way we address uh, climate change. Um, and one uh, suggestion we make is that we need to adjust long term scenarios to become more consistent with the net zero pathway for 1.5 degrees Celsius. And also complement these with sort of shorter term outlooks, not least because much of the investment to achieve net zero needs to be front loaded, particularly this decade and early uh, the following uh, decade. Fourth recommendation around monetary policy. We, we saw an example of that from the, the UK uh, just a few moments ago. And here again, uh, the, the recommendation is to integrate net zero uh, targets into policy frameworks and also into monetary operations, including uh, collateral, uh, refinancing and asset purchase programs. And perhaps that could be done by requiring corporate issuers to have credible net zero plan, something that uh, shareholders are asking of the, the companies they own. And this would provide a forward looking signals to companies about access to uh, uh, central bank operations uh, if they develop these credible uh, plans. Fifth area, portfolio management, which flows from this. A number of central banks are now adopting responsible investment policies. Uh, and we suggest that these should include a net zero target and plan uh, to achieve it, just like other asset owners. And I think the work that the Banque de France has been doing here is probably at the, the leading, uh, leading example in terms of portfolio uh, management. Then the issue of, of the just transition um, in terms of ensuring that the transition to a, a net zero economy uh, does not uh, leave uh, communities uh, behind. Clearly, this is a primary role for government policy in terms of re regional policy, training policy, et cetera, et cetera. But there potentially could be a, a role for central banks uh, also. And, and we uh, suggest that uh, stress test results potentially could be used to explore the implications of net zero for jobs and regions, particularly to identify concentration risks that might be building up in high carbon uh, sectors. And finally, international cooperation. Uh, net zero is a global goal, a global commitment under the Paris Agreement. And, and it is important that not just individual uh, institutions at the national level take account of this, but also this becomes an area for international cooperation uh, within the IMF. For example, the Article 4 process, the FSB, the BIS, and I'm sure Luis will give us his, his, his ideas there, uh, insurance supervisors, security supervisors, and also the Network for Greening the Financial System, the premium body for 
uh, encouraging action by, by central banks and supervisors. And there will be a particular need, I think, uh, for partnerships to support uh, authorities in developing and emerging uh, economies. So those are our uh, recommendations. And I'll just close with a few uh, remarks. Um, we're starting to see signals of, of, of recognition from central banks and the beginning of action to align their activities with net zero. Clearly, each central bank and supervisor needs to develop their own approach based on their mandate. We believe that no formal change in mandates is needed, but clarification uh, will obviously be helpful, as has happened in the UK, and also particularly clarification around sort of key principles, such as uh, market neutrality. Uh, in terms of our work, our, we will be applying this framework in a, in a paper in the coming months uh, to the EU and particularly uh, to the Euro system. Uh, and, and I think now, as, as you were suggesting at the beginning, Manoush, in the run-up to COP26, this is the moment really for central banks and supervisors to start really to set out how they'll support uh, the transition to a net zero financial system and uh, economy. So I'm going to stop there, Manoush, uh, and stop sharing my screen and hand back to you. Thank you very much. Very good. Thank you very much, Nick. And now turn to Luis for his reactions. And you're on mute, Luis. Thank you very much, uh, Minush. Thank you very much, uh, Nick, for this uh, very thoughtful uh, presentation and very comprehensive uh, uh, report. I think you are absolutely right in saying that the key uh, here is the uh, uh, implementation of uh, policies according to uh, central bank uh, mandates. I just uh, want to say that I'm speaking here uh, on a personal uh, capacity. Uh, and uh, of course, the order uh, of uh, implementation depends on the way in which uh, governments uh, commit themselves to a carbon neutral uh, objective. And the good news is that increasingly, as uh, you point out, a great number of countries have been uh, embracing uh, the goal. Actually, uh, uh, it's about uh, the countries you mentioned, the 113 countries that have committed explicitly represent over 50% of the world's uh, uh, GDP. So my, uh, let me uh, uh, make three points on the commenting uh, this very thoughtful uh, report about the effectiveness in the implementation of, uh, of these uh, uh, policies. I think the delicate point is uh, about uh, the political economy of this uh, transition. Obviously, uh, when you embrace an ambitious goal of uh, carbon zero, who is going to be uh, the leading force to transform uh, your financial sector? Actually, many private and private sector entities are leading the path. And in some cases, the official sector is almost uh, uh, lagging uh, behind. So uh, can central banks contribute to uh, the goal? I think absolutely yes. But there is uh, a, um, uh, a delicate balance uh, in terms of the interpretation of some of the current mandates uh, that central banks have. Of course, nobody is saying that they uh, are ignorant of uh, the risks related to uh, climate change. I think uh, you pointed out that today uh, in the community, uh, there is almost unanimity to address uh, uh, the risk, but the how uh, is, uh, is what is still uh, in debate. Uh, for example, because of uh, uh, perhaps uh, doing too much uh, being a threat to their current uh, mandates. Now, there is many things that, uh, as you point out, uh, in order to uh, reach uh, carbon neutrality, central banks can do within their mandates. Let me list uh, uh, one that perhaps uh, we uh, at the BIS emphasized in our last uh, publication last year, uh, the book uh, called the, the Green Swan. It's the, the mindset about risks. Uh, within their mandates, I think central banks can, uh, can show that uh, uh, risks related to climate change are much more complicated than, than we thought uh, even a few years ago. Uh, 
that uh, the, the approach uh, has to take into account uncertainty, has to take into account nonlinearity. And there is an intertween uh, uh, risks between not only climate change, but also biodiversity and the current uh, version of zoonosis that uh, is hitting us through a pandemic. So these, these, the, the way in which uh, uh, central banks can lead uh, the idea of uh, changing risk models and changes the perceptions that we have about uh, these global uh, negative externalities would be already a very good contribution to move uh, the financial sector towards uh, acting on these risks and acting towards uh, carbon neutrality. A second observation that perhaps uh, is uh, in the, the report uh, when you talked uh, about uh, 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 regions and jobs, but I think uh, could be perhaps emphasized a bit more is the redistributive impact of both climate change and also itself and also the policies uh, to combat uh, uh, global uh, warming. Even if central banks lead the action uh, towards uh, uh, carbon neutrality, and they can certainly influence uh, the financial sector, there will be, as we know, uh, uh, heavy costs to uh, adaptation and, and mitigations. And uh, we know that uh, the transition is likely to hit more the poor in rich countries and uh, poor countries in, in the world. So if we move to carbon neutrality, we also need to have, and this has to do with somehow uh, your analysis, Nick, about uh, jobs and about uh, international cooperation, we need to think about uh, uh, the way in which uh, all these uh, good policies that will be put in place will have redistributive uh, implications. The poor again in rich countries and poor countries. So what kind of compensatory transfers, what kind of policies we need to think about. Finally, third observation, the uh, growth impact of uh, what uh, these policies will imply uh, in the transition and in the mitigation. This has to do also with re redistribution but it's more perhaps about the narrative, the perception that uh, you need to find a way in which the policies that will be put in place towards carbon neutrality are somehow in a scenario-based analysis. And I'm sure that uh, Sarah will be talking about that when she uh, uh, talks about maybe scenario analysis. There could be scenarios that are at the same time compatible with carbon neutrality but could be also growth enhancing. Now, how could these scenarios be constructed? Well, you have to look at uh, what would be the best set of uh, uh, policies that would combine uh, the incentives uh, to more research, the incentives to alternative sources of energies uh, with uh, the best uh, studies that we have about, for example, fiscal uh, multipliers associated with green recoveries. I'm referring, for example, to the study by, by Nick Stern and Joe Stiglitz uh, precisely listing what are these kinds of uh, uh, policies that can combine uh, a, a path towards carbon neutrality and at the same time growth enhancing uh, set of policies. So in other words, and to, just to finish, uh, I guess if you combine a good political economy setup for the transition where central banks can certainly play a role, a good analysis of the distributive impacts of these policies, and at the same time, a good narrative about growth, uh, central banks in a coordinating role within their mandates and respecting uh, the, uh, the commitments that they have within their jurisdictions can certainly do a lot to sort of make sure that uh, this is clearly set up to societies and that uh, they can then contribute to carbon neutrality with their governments. Thank you, I stop here. Thank you so much, Louise. Let me now turn to Sarah. Thanks, Manoush. Uh, a great presentation and a great report, Nick. Uh, some great challenges for us as central banks. 
and I expect a great debate uh, from here. So thank you very much for inviting me. I thought I'd try and cover three things in my brief remarks. Firstly, what I think of your rationale for action. Secondly, my views on the recommendations and a brief canter through some of the work we're doing at the Bank of England. And then thirdly, some challenges as we look ahead. On the rationale, you won't be surprised to hear that I support the rationale that you set out in your report for central banks to be focused on net zero. That's both because, uh, as you say, the sooner we start, the smoother the path to net zero. And so the fewer economic costs and financial risks that we will incur and that we care about as central banks uh, uh, along the way. But it's also because we can act in a way that's coherent with government policy, as you said, Nick, and as Manoush, you said, that's very real for the Bank of England right now, as of the budget, both the FBC and importantly, also the MPC, our Monetary Policy Committee, have been given as part of their remits an expectation to have regard to the transition to net zero. And the government has said that it expects to give the Prudential Regulation Committee uh, the same uh, have regard to. And indeed, there's a debate going on in the House of Lords right now as to whether the law to bring in Basel 3.1 in the UK should have regard to net zero as well. So I think we're all clear that we should think about net zero as we go about doing our central banking jobs. The interesting questions are then how do we go about doing it? Let me pick up on a couple of your recommendations there. I absolutely agree with the importance of strategy. We published our strategy in the Bank of England's very first TCFD report last year, where we became the first central bank ever to cover the entirety of our operations, both our operations as a corporate, when we print banknotes, when we used to fly uh, around the world, when we heat our buildings, but also our entire balance sheet, including our monetary operations. The process to get there was absolutely key because it had the entirety of the institution, its most senior individuals, talking about what did climate change mean for the entirety of our operations and what we were going, what were we going to do on uh, the back of that. Uh, and reflecting the innovation in that report, I'm thrilled to say that on Monday we won the Central Bank Green Initiative uh, Award for our work all of which is just to underline the importance of strategy. Uh, I wanted to stress to the importance of the prudential regulation measures. As you said, Nick, transition to net zero is going to require billions in a UK context and trillions globally. And so if we focus on the financial system and ensure the financial system is playing its part in supporting that orderly transition to net zero. That will be a key contribution we can make. In my view, if there's a single thing that we can do to support net zero, it's to make sure that the financial system is taking net zero into account and bringing its trillions uh, to the table to support that transition. That's about the safety and soundness of the firms that we supervise. We introduced uh, expectations for them back in April 2019, and we've set an expectation that those are embedded in all of those firms by the end of this year. But it's also about scenario analysis and what's happening at the level of the system, uh, as we'll be judging through the forthcoming climate BES, our, our exploratory scenario, which is well in hand and due to be launched in June. That's really tough analytically. We need multiple scenarios because we don't know what will happen. We need to look decades ahead because that's the relevant horizon to drive action today. We need coherent scenarios that describe climate outcomes, policy outcomes, macroeconomic outcomes and financial risk. And we need the outcomes to be modeled 
granularly bottom up. Uh, so that is a really tough ask. We also, though, need to think about how we manage our own balance sheet. And as you said, we've said that we will set out how we are going to manage our own balance sheet and in particular our corporate bond portfolio, given our new mandate to have regards to net zero in our monetary policy operations. Now, let me emphasize that portfolio is small. It's 20 billion pounds. It is the cherry on top of the icing on top of the cake that is the global financial system at best. But what we're doing as we think about that is trying to develop an approach that if it were applied across the financial system as a whole, if we led by example, it would drive the outcomes that we wish to see. So it's not enough just to buy green. We need to support the economy-wide transition to net zero. Uh, that, of course, is easier said uh, than done. Let me end then with three challenges as we look ahead. Uh, and it picks up Nick and Lewis on points uh, that you have mentioned. We obviously need to liaise closely, closely with government policymakers as we plot our course from here. A central bank's work becomes much clearer and much easier if we have sectoral paths for the real economy and forward climate policy. Without that, we are in danger of being backseat drivers, and that risks undermining the work that we can do in this space and should be avoided at all costs. We must be a complement, a catalyst, and an amplifier and not a substitute for wider policy action. Second challenge, the data and analytical foundations on which we're building this work need strengthening. We don't have a how-to guide for uh, modeling and managing this new set of uh, issues. Our models and our methodologies are incomplete and inadequate. The granular and forward-looking data we need is missing, and yet we need to act now. Uh, the authorities have got a role to play in bringing forward that greater solid analytical foundations, but we need everybody's help on that challenge too, and I fully expect the LSE uh, to rise to it. And then finally, we need to work together internationally if we're to solve this uh, challenge. There's a whole load of activity happening here, the NGFS, the G7, the G20, the FSB, the BCBS, the IAIS, IOSCO, and of course, COP26. And there's a tough balancing act here between the need for international coordination and the need for urgent action, because as we all know, international coordination uh, takes time. We we'll do our very best uh, to manage uh, that challenge, but it isn't going to be easy. Minouche, back to you. Thank you so much, Sarah, for uh, help sharing the coal face with us and what it looks like actually trying to implement this. Uh, let's turn to Ulrich. Thank you very much, Minouche, and uh, it, it's really a great pleasure and privilege to discuss our new report in such an esteemed company, and uh, Sarah and Louis have really made excellent points. Um, I would like to highlight two issues, uh, two points that we make in the report that I think are really important and that um, also resonate very well with what Louis and uh, Sarah just said. So the first is the importance of double materiality which is really uh, gaining a lot of traction now in financial decision-making. So double materiality basically means that financial institutions, and that has to include central banks, need to understand and manage not only the risks that environmental factors pose for, uh, for their own balance sheets um, and operations, but also the risks that their own activities create in terms of intensifying climate change. And this is highly relevant for the way in which monetary and financial authorities should consider their role in achieving net zero. So clearly in terms of monetary policy operations, uh, central banks need to take uh, care to avoid providing liquidity uh, to sectors uh, that actually have to shrink as part of the transition. 
And this is certainly not easy, but um, uh, Nick highlighted that uh, one way would be to uh, demand credible net zero transition plans from the various actors. And, and this can then be taken into account by public uh, authorities. Um, and uh, failing uh, to uh, take uh, carbon risk into account on central bank balance sheets is not only then a risk in the balance sheet of the central bank, uh, but it could uh, reverberate back in the future. A second point and uh, very related is uh, uh, the uh, import, uh, importance of realizing that the actions, but also very much the inaction of central banks and supervisors uh, will have very profound implications on the uh, expectations and the behavior of financial markets. And by what central banks do or what they don't do, they can and do shape markets. Um, and that is a really important point um, because markets respond to signals from central banks. And Louis, I think, uh, had a very important point about uh, central banks' ability to shape how financial actors think about risk. And that is really crucial. And so in our net zero context, the seriousness of intent with which central banks pursue net zero targets and set out clear net zero strategies uh, will have very profound impact on how financial markets will, will develop. And uh, so this will have impact on uh, capital formation and will actually cause a lot of kind of lock-in effects. Uh, so there is a great past dependency on policy signals coming now from central banks, from supervisors, um, and we need to make sure that these, these are the right policy signals so that these incentivize the right kind of behaviors um, to make sure that we can achieve net zero. And uh, uh, so I, I would very much agree that um, the, what, what Sarah said, um, uh, it, it's the, uh, you know, trying to move financial markets in the right direction. You know, uh, people always like to talk about green QE and all these kind of things. This is not really what, what net zero central banking is about. Is it about setting a very clear path for each and every actor in the financial system uh, to align with net zero transition paths? And um, so some of the ideas we present in this report are still fairly high level. Um, uh, Nick, Simon and I are currently working, as Nick mentioned, on kind of a, a deeper analysis for the European context. And as you know, the European Central Bank had its strategic review. So uh, it is important and a great opportunity to feed into that one. Uh, but we're also looking at uh, emerging uh, economies, developing economies, uh, because they also have to find their uh, pathway to net zero. Um, and central banks and supervisors there also have to be part of that story. Uh, let me finish here and, and thanks a lot. Thank you, Ulrich. Now the questions are starting to pour in, so let me get started. The first one I think I'm going to point in the direction of either Luis or Nick, which is from Tracy Zalk. An issue with net zero is that it's framed from the perspective of in-country emissions, and this can lead to offshoring of emissions. On a global basis, that would likely lead to missing total emissions targets as well as further inequality. An advantage of net zero initiatives in the financial sector is that because it's at a portfolio level, they don't need to be constrained by the framing of in-country emissions. Are you highlighting this or agree with this as a need as a need for focus so that global total emissions remain within a sustainable level? Nick or Louise, would either of you like to? That one. I think that's a, that's a, that's a very good uh, observation, and I think that's where I think if you look at um, uh, the, the evolution of net zero policies, um, both coming through at the moment on a voluntary basis by by banks, um, a large international bank registered in the UK will be need, thinking about net zero not just for its uh, loan book uh, in, in the UK, but also in, in China, in India, in the USA, uh, and so on. So I think. Having that global aspect, particularly for um, sort of 
financial systems which are highly international, the UK, uh, also uh, other, other European countries, uh, the US and so on, that will be by nature will have uh, broad in international implications. So I think that's a, that's, a, that's a very profound point and one worth uh, taking forward and particularly then thinking through what that means for uh, international frameworks uh, as, mm -hmm. as you start thinking about that uh, coordination across boundaries. Thank you. It's also a way to bring in countries who haven't yet made net zero commitments into the frame uh, through, through their financial systems. Let me turn to a question, uh, which I think I might start with Nick, but any others can join in. Uh, Mike Clark at Aereo Advisory or it says, does net zero place too much focus on mitigation, suggesting we need to start to refer to net zero plus, which ensures adaptation, very necessary, not a mitigation failure, so that adaptation gets equal attention. The just transition requires net zero plus, I suggest. Uh, Nick or Ulrich, did you want to come in on that? Or Sarah wants to come in too. Uh, maybe I'll take Sarah and Ulrich, how's that? So one of the things that we've been really keen to do in the scenario analysis that we've been doing in the NGFS and more broadly is make sure that we don't just focus either on physical risks or transition risks, but that we take both into account because that is the world that we are going to face and therefore the ones that we need to take our decisions in. So our aim in the uh, scenario analysis that we're undertaking that I described earlier is to get the banks and the insurers that participate in it to look at the physical risks and the transition risks in each of the three uh, scenarios. So one where we carry on our current emissions curve, two where we get to net zero, one in an orderly way, one where action comes late. And in all of those, physical risk is key. And we will be expecting there to be a focus on what needs to happen to take account of those physical risks as well. So certainly in how we're thinking about it, we're thinking about this whole economy, uh, not just in the UK, but more broadly, and physical and transition risks together. Ulrich, you wanted to add something? Yeah, so uh, I, I very much agree that adaptation uh, is, is not getting uh, enough attention. So. Uh, adaptation is really a very crucial part and uh, we've actually published in October a report on climate change and sovereign risk where we show how both physical and transition impacts can have quite dramatic impacts on uh, macro financial stability and um, we have also shown uh, and the IMF has also followed up on that uh, that um, uh, these risks also uh, increase the cost of capital and so there's a very strong rationale for governments and certainly also central banks and supervisors to first of all identify these risks and really try to push adaptation as much as possible um, to mitigate and ma better manage these risks and, and there's an important role for finance ministries but, but certainly also for central banks and supervisors. Great, thank uh, you. Minush, can I, yes, can please, I add please. something on that? Please, yeah. So yes, indeed, uh, in, in net zero, there is net. So uh, I think we should uh, pay attention to the fact that uh, by, by also providing a strategy for adaptation, which for example, mean uh, uh, looking at what sort of uh, investment in alternative sources of energy can sort of be, uh, be undertaken uh, by, by other actors in society, what type of research and this has to do with the capacity also, as I was uh, uh, saying previously, you can generate a, uh, a, a growth pass in the strategy uh, towards uh, uh, net zero. So there are a number of things. Uh, think for example, of massive research efforts towards carbon capture. Uh, mm -hmm. We know that uh, the budget is, uh, is there by the IPCC, 420 uh, gigatons. So the efforts towards uh, sticking to this budget has to do with both the strategy for uh, mitigation, which is the number of things that uh, Nick, Sarah and Ulrich uh, mentioned where central banks can play a very important role, uh, 
but also towards uh, having uh, investment uh, strategies uh, that could be public and private sector that would create uh, new uh, capacities to absorb carbon and also new research uh, and new alternative sources of energy that would uh, uh, transform uh, our, our environment as well. Great, thank you. Let me turn to the next question from Hugh Miller, who's an LSE MSc student, and it's for Sarah. Uh, you've previously mentioned that any changes to prudential measures ought to be risk-based in order to be appropriate. However, it's difficult to quantify transition risks based on historical data. So how do you think it's most appropriate to incorporate these risks into the prudential regime? Is there any specific policy which, in your view, is most appropriate to help mitigate these risks and facilitate a smooth transition? And are you in favor of forward-looking disclosure over a carbon taxonomy to identify and assess these risks and banks' exposure? Great question. Uh, and I think you're right to think about uh, the prudential regime operating at different levels. The pillar three regime, as we call it, is the disclosure regime. Disclosing forward-looking assessments of the risk in financial institutions' portfolios is absolutely key. Certainly think that the prudential regime should bring that uh, in and uh, thinking about transition taxonomies, uh, which of firm's assets are on the way to net zero, which are not, is an important part of that regime. The second thing we can look to do is to use our pillar two regime, which tries to think about which institutions are doing a good job and a bad job of managing this risk, which institutions are particularly exposed to this uh, risk, and we can, if appropriate, introduce extra capital requirements to compensate for that risk. You, you can work out who is using forward carbon prices in their credit assessment processes and who is not. And that'll give you a pretty good sense of who is uh, dealing with this risk in a, uh, in, a, in, a, in a good way. And you can think about whose asset portfolios are perhaps particularly exposed to uh, companies or geographies that are um, uh, susceptible to these risks. But the nirvana here is if we could incorporate this in our pillar one regime at an individual asset level so that we can have a sense of, uh, of using the capital regime as a price incentive to uh, get the right sorts of decisions made in uh, the financial system. For that to happen, that's where you need the government policy. If we had sectoral paths for what the real economy transition looks like, we could incorporate that uh, into our regime. If we have a forward price for carbon, we can incorporate that into our regime. So that's where it goes back to the point that I think all of us have made, uh, that central banks and the prudential regime have got an important role to play but it's a complement, not a substitute, and it can be a really powerful catalyst and amplifier of the government policy on change in the real economy. Okay. Next question uh, could be for any of the panel, actually, but possibly Sarah as well, from Katie Kedwood at the UCL Institute for Innovation and Public Purpose. And the question is, I'd like to congratulate the BO, the Bank of England, on taking leading steps to decarbonize. As Sarah noted, this, this is a very, the, sorry, to decarbonize the corporate bond scheme, which I feel a bit proprietary about because it's, yeah. I, I was responsible. You remember that. I created it, yeah. As Sarah noted, this is a very small portfolio. Will the bank extend the same climate aligned eligibility criteria as it develop, it develop, it develops for asset purchases to apply also to the collateral framework? The so rationale for doing so is identical, prudential risk management, but it would have a much bigger impact if it was part of the collateral framework. 
it, 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 we're starting to do that even now. So uh, in order to uh, borrow from us, as Manoush uh, will remember from when she was the deputy governor responsible, individual institutions have got to provide relevant information to us about how they risk manage the collateral that they give to us. And already we're asking them to explain to us how they manage the climate risks in their uh, collateral uh, and, and that will be something that we will build on uh, from here. Again, the same sort of issues arise as I, as I talked about in response to the previous question. You can relatively easily identify which firms are doing a good job and doing a bad job of managing climate related risks. It's much harder to look at it at the individual level, uh, the individual asset absence, uh, the sectoral and forward climate policy from, uh, from government. And that's where, again, I would hope that working together with finance ministries, we may be able to have an even greater uh, impact, but uh, it is definitely the case that we're thinking about it in respect of the collateral we take, as well as the assets uh, that we purchase as part of QE. Uh, but just like I say, let's just remember this is hard to do absent the transition path from government. Absolutely. I mean, I guess I just have to ask a question here, which is uh, the doctrine of market neutrality, which is so central to central banking, both in terms of asset purchases and collateral, where you don't want to distort the market outcomes uh, with other policy priorities. I just would love to hear any of the panel speak to the question, how do you get your head around the market neutrality debate? And also the tricky question of, are central bank tools the best tools to achieve these objectives? Who would like to take that one? Nick, do you want to start? Well, I think market neutrality is a very useful and necessary guide, but clearly we're operating in a situation of market failures. We have pervasive market failures, and this is the problem with climate change, that um, market prices aren't uh, reflecting the costs of carbon pollution. Uh, clearly, one way of doing that is we need real economy policy, carbon pricing, clean energy policies, and, and, and all that. And we also know that many of the ways in which asset, asset prices are developed also do not include uh, climate risks and carbon risks. So, so I think market neutrality, yes, but we need to think about how it takes account of that, that market failure uh, and how we can um, sort of address some of the carbon bias that, that therefore results in the sense, the current sort of traditional conventional interpretation of market neutrality almost automatically generates a carbon bias. Uh, and so I think it's sort of reflecting that the, the sort of the, the principle is right, but it needs to be updated to take account of that uh, that market failure. Sarah, you wanted to come in. So maybe I'll just build on that. I think the uh, the point about missing markets is is spot on. So the challenge that we are trying to set ourselves and and will uh, will share as uh, once our thinking is uh, a little bit further developed is how do we create a climate neutral market benchmark, uh, climate uh, friendly market neutrality. Uh, that is easier said than than done. Um, uh, but we are, we're putting our very best brains uh, to it. But I did want to come back to your point, Manoush, about the danger of overreach and being seen to be a backseat driver here and trying to manage that balance between leading by example in the way that we want the financial system to behave and having a climate friendly uh, approach to uh, investment whilst at the same time not being accused of being an unelected uh, set of uh, technocrats who are determining the path to net zero, which is rightly the responsibility of elected officials. Getting that balance right is, uh, is gonna be tough. We'll try. <laughs> Ulrich, you wanted to come in. Yeah, market failures uh, or kind of market neutrality is one of my favorite topics. Um, and in that context, I always like to quote Nick Stern, who, who famously called uh, climate change the greatest market failure ever. And I think it, it you know, it is undisputed that um, uh, climate risks are absolutely insufficiently uh, uh, calculated and priced by the market. And so 
if central banks take current markets as a guide, they are basically just perpetuating this big market failure. Mm. Um, and you know the, the point that Louis made about you know people need to get uh, uh, the the analysis of these risks right. You know this is so important, and therefore the central bank cannot rely on markets which, for the time being, by and large, don't get it right uh, to to do that. So, and I would again like to to emphasize the market shaping role of central banks. This is, I think, such a crucial point. Um, so uh, central banks don't need to uh, uh, undertake industrial policy. There clearly is a very important role for, uh, for, for governments for, uh, for doing that, but um, uh, they should not be constraining themselves to uh, a concept that are completely out of date in this context. I mean, uh, oops, uh, sorry. <laughs> I'm going to throw in a related question and then I'll come to Luis and back to Sarah from Ivan Faella, senior economist at the Bank of Italy, who argues that monetary and macro prudential policies might indeed play a role in tackling climate change, but it should be clear that they what they can do with these tools is limited compared to what governments can do with the instruments at their disposal. Central bank policy shouldn't be used as an excuse to justify inaction by governments on climate change. So just to add that to the mix, Luis and Sarah. Uh, indeed, I think uh, uh, what uh, Uric was saying uh, is, uh, is very important. The uh, uh, risk approach is changing and it's changing in many dimensions and it's tilting the balance uh, towards uh, uh, carbon uh, neutrality progressively. So it's, uh, it's a long process where you have a combination of uh, changing preferences in uh, civil society, putting pressure on many actors, including uh, central banks, the financial sector, asset managers, the capacity of uh, uh, major actors such as central banks to point to these uh, very different types of risks that climate change uh, uh, bring, uh, bring to us is an important contribution to make these uh, changes in relative costs that people perceive are more legitimate. When you impose out of the blue, uh, a taxation on something that is not environmental friendly, it's different than now being perceived as uh, something that society accepts uh, uh, increasingly because of their perception uh, of the dangers of climate change. I think we had an illustration of uh, the way in which the pandemic, which uh, people now begin associating to the loss of biodiversity, the, 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 the relationship with climate change is convincing more and more uh, segments, large segments in society of the need to take action on climate change. So I see all this as many uh, uh, changes in perceptions, in risk, uh, in the uh, dangers that uh, climate change brings to us as contributing factors to this, uh, these goals where Ivan is correct. It's not a single actor that has a silver bullet to this process. There are many important contributions that in a coordinated way will progressively move us towards at the same time a repricing of this externality and at the same time a change in our individual corporate financial behavior, which would uh, enable us to move towards uh, uh, net, uh, net zero. So it's a combination of these various moves by various actors. And, and to be honest, personally, I think it's gonna be a bit messy. Uh, <laughs> But that's the way it is, and you will have back and forth. But if we manage to move in the right direction, even with uh, uh, some of these uh, 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 not necessarily fully perfect behaviors, then we will be uh, pro make, making progress. Sarah, you wanted to come in, and then I will turn to Ulrich and Nick just for any final thoughts uh, that they might want to add from based on the report. Sarah. 
Thanks, Minouche. I, I really do think that it is all about system-wide change. Uh, we are an important part of that change. We are not the only part of that change. So we can catalyze, we can amplify, and we can complement, uh, but we need wider policy action too. That is not to diminish our role, it is just to set it in context. Very good point. Ulrich, and then I'll give Nick the, la the last word. Yeah, I actually very much like uh, uh, Sarah's framing of complementing, uh, catalyzing and, and amplifying that change. Um, but also the emphasis that, that central bank supervisors do have a key role. Um, you know, and, and by emphasizing that one is in no way diminishing the role that has to be played by governments, but um, uh, central banks alone won't be able to really change uh, things, but uh, governments without having central bank policy, supervisory policy aligned, uh, won't really do the trick either. And this is why in the report we emphasize so much the importance for central banks and supervisors to align their policies and their strategies mm -hmm. with government-led net zero policies. Um, and I'd like to thank everyone so much. It was really great to have all these great comments and, and discussions. Thank you. Nick? Well, thanks for me. And I, and I think we have a sort of, not just a double helix, but maybe a quadruple helix of these things moving together. Clearly, government policy, uh, financial market operations, civil society, but also central banks and supervisors. And if we have those things working together, then I think we're going to get the system change we need. So thanks again for, for all the comments. Uh, great. Thanks so much. Back to you, Manish. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, well, we've still got about 38 questions coming in. So you can see there's a huge amount of interest, but I think it reflects the fact that we are at a big transitional moment. And uh, there's huge interest and curiosity about how to do this. Uh, I guess it is one of those policy lessons that when you want to move big things, you have to pull many policy levers. Uh, and central banks have an important role to play uh, as part of this big thing that we need to get done. So thank you so much to this fantastic panel. I really brought insight and, uh, and a real sense of, uh, of issues that are very uh, topical that are being figured out as we speak. Uh, and so the report is timely and I hope you all enjoy it. It's available on the chat. It's available on the LSE website. Uh, and I hope you found this event enjoyable and please do come back for other LSE events in future. Thank you to the panel again and thank you to the audience. Bye everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks.